All right, well, I'm glad to be here again. It's always fun to come to Otis. Last time I was here was in February. Um, I live actually, oh, I don't know, about 40 minutes from here on the other side, of, about northwest of Spokane. So it's a nice drive. I took the scenic route today and um, got kind of lost and turned around, but I made it in plenty of time and I beat most of you here and you wouldn't have known that unless I told you, right? So, so all is good. Years ago, I had gone to a, a church to preach and uh, I, had, I had quoted in my sermon, and it was just an illustration, it wasn't what the sermon was about, it was just a, a quote that I had used from a book that I had read that I really liked. And the, uh, uh, I don't, it doesn't even matter what it was, because uh, the point of my story I'll get to in just a second here, but uh, I, I, I made my, I, I, I gave my illustration and I, I went on my way and I got down and I went to the back of the church and People were filing out, and this fella came back there, and he was just really upset with me, really upset. And uh, he, he couldn't stand this uh, idea that I had used this quote. He felt it was wrong, and he really went after me on it. As a matter of fact, he got so upset about it, he tried to get me banned from the church where I was speaking at. Um, and he also went to other people, and he complained about me and whatnot. And this is not unusual, by the way, when you get up front and you, you, you talk and you preach. Uh, you're going to have people that disagree with you. You're going to have people that don't see things the same way you do. And you know what? That's fine. We're all here together, and I always encourage people, uh, you know, go check it out for yourself then. Uh, tell me what you think. You know, it's like I, I'm not standing up here telling you I'm always right, although I, I do, do do a pretty good thorough job of, of uh, going through everything that I do. But anyway, uh, sometime after that, the same individual, and by the way, I still like this guy, so, so uh, no hard feelings but, at all, but uh, he came to me and he gave me a book, and um, he handed me this book, and it was about this thick, and he said, I want you to read this, because he was wanting to prove me wrong is what he was doing. And I took the book, and I tried to read it, and I want to tell you, it was, it was incredibly boring, and I just could not get through this book. And so I put it on the shelf, and there it sat for years, until about, I don't know, last year sometime, a mute, another friend of mine approached me, and he, he, well, actually, he called me up, and he told me that he had this book that he wanted me to read, and it was such a fantastic read, and he couldn't put it down, and he was going on, and he began to describe the book. And as he began to describe the book, I realized that the book that he was telling me was the book that this guy had given me, that I had such a hard time getting through. And I told him, I said, that book was horribly boring. And he said, oh man, he said, no. He said, so he, he talked, we talked a little while, and finally we decided that I would I'd give it another chance. I'd give the book another chance. And the book itself um, dealt with righteousness by faith, by the way. And that subject is not boring in the least. I just didn't like, at the time, the way this other book was written. But I went ahead and I read the book. And you know, when he recommended it to me, it was a different outcome because I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed the book. And um, it's actually called The Return of the Latter Rain, in case any of you are, are interested in reading it. It's a historical viewpoint on righteousness by faith in regards to the Seventh day Adventist Church back in the 1880s. And uh, without going any further into it, what I'm going to talk to you about today is related to that. This year, I did a whole series on. Um, the Holy Spirit, Righteousness by Faith. Unfortunately, because of this whole thing going on, I've had very few opportunities to speak. Um, and so this is my second in that series. The first that I gave was the one I gave here at Otis in February, and that was uh, Praying by Promise for the Holy Spirit. This one here, though, I'm going to talk about something that every one of us have heard. And it's not a matter of what we've heard. It's more of a, a matter of our understanding of it. And the scripture that I'm referring to is Revelation 14, 12. And I know that you've heard this scripture. Uh, if you know anything about the three angels' message, you've heard this scripture. So that means if you've been a Seventh-day Adventist for any substan substantial amount of time, you would know this verse. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandment of God and, these, and, and the faith of Jesus. And so here you have a scripture, and you could put it in context, by the way, of the setting with which, which it's, it's given. And that's the three angels' message. It's a time of persecution, but you could really look at the church and say, the church has always been persecuted. We have in this country had the freedom to be able to preach all these years, and we still do have that freedom. But I can tell you right now, it's, it's, it's going to come to a time when that will not be the case. 
and anything out of the Bible will be considered hate speech by many, many groups and many people. Um, it's interesting as you read the Three Angels' message, though, we see a revival coming in this country of, of uh, a, a, a church revival, so to speak, although it's a false revival that is coming, um, at least in terms of the majority. I know there's a true revival coming among the people of God. But as we, as we look at this scripture and the context with which it is given, here we have patient endurance that it's talking about, the saints that have patient endurance because they are enduring something that's going on. Read the three angels' message and you'll know what that is. It talks about those that are faithful and obedient to God. But the part that I want to get to in the scripture is the reason why they have patient endurance and the reason why it is that they keep the commandments of God. And if you'll read it, it's right at the very end. It's because they have the faith of Jesus. That is why it is. But we look at the faith of Jesus, and we, I, I, we need to dig into it to find out exactly what it means. So in, cha in Romans chapter 3, this is an excellent sc scripture, by the way, because it explains about the faith of Jesus and what the faith of Jesus is. And if you've heard the terms righteousness by faith, justification by faith, the robes of Christ's righteousness, if you've heard those things, I'm just going to tell you right up front, this has everything to do with those statements, with those words, with those, th those, those phrases. But here it goes in Romans chapter 3. Let me read it to you. And then I'm going to bullet point it for you as soon as I'm done reading it so we can understand what it is that's being told us here in Romans. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And that's a reference to the Old Testament, by the way, which also pointed to Christ's righteousness. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all heard that scripture, right? Well, <clears throat> being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate the, his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has what? The faith of Jesus. And so he's talking about this very phrase that we're talking about today, and so we want to understand. So we're going to bullet point this real quick, what we just read. Number one, what we're being told in Romans here is that the law itself will not save you. That the law by itself will not save you in and of itself. There has to be something that accompanies it. Number two, that God reveals his righteousness through Jesus Christ. And if you read back in Matthew, for example, it talks in there about about Emmanuel, God with us. And we understand that the reason God sent Jesus to us was to reveal his love and who he is through Jesus. And the Bible teaches that as well. This is something that's being talked about in this. But it all ties together. Number three, bullet point. We receive this righteousness through our faith or belief in Jesus as the Son of God. And you know, for example, Antichrist denies that Jesus is the Son of God. And so we look at this and we say, okay, well... Um, we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I'm going to get into that more in depth in just a second here. But we also understand that it is by the power of the Holy Spirit that this happens. And we have to always include that. And you'll probably hear me say that several times here in the next few minutes. We have to understand how it relates to as far as the Holy Spirit being uh, playing the significant role here. And number four, as a result, we can only be justified by Christ's merits. And this is... This is an interesting part here. I know it's very easy to get caught up in this whole world of what can I do to be saved? What can I do to, to, to be righteous? What can I do to, to, to gain salvation? And this is a very tricky thing for a lot of people because we want to, as human beings, we want to try to do things on our own. But God says, no, you have to rely on me. And that's a very deep subject. There's a lot going on with that. I don't think it's deep in terms of understanding it. I think it's deep in human beings grasping it and utilizing it to, to the full extent. So, as we look at this, we look at the merits of Jesus Christ, we have to understand what those merits are. And it's, it's very common for people, when they look at Jesus' merits, to say, Jesus died on the cross so that my sins could be forgiven, and these are the merits that I stand on. But you're missing the whole picture if that's what you're limiting yourself to. Because Jesus was here on this earth. Listen, you've got divine, you've got human, they're combined, you've got somebody willing to come 
and to live and to die for you. That in itself is a merit. You see what I'm saying? You've got somebody who lived a perfect example in his life so that we would have that example. That is a merit. You've got somebody who died for you, which of course we understand that as a merit. We look at Jesus being raised from, from having victory over death and over sin. That is a merit. You see what I'm saying? Listen to this quote out of Review and Herald from over 100 years ago. Remember, Jesus not only died for your sins, he lived a perfect life while on this earth as an example of true righteousness on your behalf. And the strength by which he lived, his life, is at our disposal. When we understand the merits of Jesus Christ, we have to include the whole package. That's really what I'm trying to tell you here. All right, so I've got this, this, um, this, this quote out of Testimonies, and I want to read this to you because it really helps us understand what the faith of Jesus is. And it's, it's really, if you break it up, if you break this, this uh, quote up into little sections here, you start seeing that um, all the ingredients, all the components for understanding this are right in this little quote. It's very similar to what I just read in Romans, and I'm sure that's where she took that from. What we need is to know God and the power of his love as revealed in Christ. Now, remember I just said that a moment ago? We understood from Romans it said that God sent his son Jesus to reveal who he was through Jesus. Then she goes on to say this. Number one, we must search the scriptures diligently and prayerfully. Number two, these are not numbered in hers. I'm just numbering them as I read them to you. Our understanding must be quickened by the Holy Spirit. So we know there's a role to play here in terms of studying, and we know there's a role in reading our Bibles and whatnot, doing the will of God, doing the Word of God, as well as by the power of the Holy Spirit. Number three, she says, our hearts must be uplifted to God in faith and hope and continual praise. And you'll find this throughout the scripture, that, that you know, it, to, to rejoice, to give thanks in all things, you know, give thanks and make your supplications known to God. Number four, through the merits of Christ, through his righteousness, which by faith is imputed unto us, we are to attain the perfection of Christian character. And so really what she's doing is she's summing up what the faith of Jesus is. And really what it is is, is justification by faith. And so if you understand it from that position, and you understand justification by faith, you can look back at Revelation 14, 12, and you can say, these, patient, these saints that are so patient, they have this patient endurance, these people that are obedient to God, they're not in that themselves obedient, they're obedient because of what? The faith of Jesus. They have been justified by faith. So they have believed in who God is. And it really involves this whole process of allowing God to take out the old you and put in the new. And one of my favorite scriptures that I love to, to, to promises that I love to, to pray when I'm praying for the Holy Spirit is this. It's found in Ezekiel. And again, this is one that you, this is one again that you uh, might recognize. It says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and to cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. You see, you can start to see now. It's starting to make sense as you read Revelation 14, 12. God says he'll take out that old self, he'll put in that new self, and he'll do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And therefore you can rely then upon the merits of Jesus Christ as opposed to your own. One of, I think, the, the most difficult things for people to understand, though, is this whole idea of what it means to believe. And believing is a, is a, is a tough topic when it comes to uh, understanding what the Bible is talking about. And I say it's tough because, again, typically we want to believe how we believe. Look, look around today and see what's going on in the world, particularly in this country. Um, when the Bible says lawlessness will abound, it, no joke. I mean, lawlessness is abounding everywhere we go. But look at what's behind it. If you look at the people that are behind what's going on today, they are doing what they believe and what they feel is right. They are doing it because they say, this is how I feel. You hear people say this all the time. I'm doing this because I know it. I know it. I just feel this in my heart that this is the right thing to do. And in, and in reality, they're relying on the wrong thing because, because the belief in oneself is a teaching that comes straight out of spiritualism. It's a teaching that we are gods, and those gods are within us, and so therefore we will judge what is right or wrong. 
And if you've ever read about spiritualism and what it is and how it's going to affect us in the last days, you can see it being manifested and played out before your very eyes. It is this belief in oneself over this belief in God. Now, if you go through the, uh, the Bible, it talks about believing in Jesus Christ and as it relates to salvation. And I think that that's a topic that, that for years, it, it, you know, it, uh, I guess maybe I had a mindset about what it meant, but not really understood what it meant. So I'm going to spend a minute here just to try to give you an idea of where I'm coming from on this in terms of what the Bible's talking about in regards to believing in something. So listen here, we're going to go step by step. We're going to use three verses, and each one of these is going to build on the next one. The first one is Acts 16, verse 31. And listen to what it says. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and what? You'll be saved. And we, I think, again, here's a scripture I think most of us are familiar with. But here's that word, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. What does it mean to believe? If you read the Bible, cross-reference, you start doing a study, you'll realize that believing in the Lord Jesus Christ is more than just saying, I'm, 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 um, I'm intellectually knowledgeable about something. Let's put it that way. 1 John 5.10, so we're going to build on that. He that believes on the Son of God has the witness in himself. So if I go back to Acts and say believing in the Lord must involve, to be saved, must involve the Holy Spirit. And we've been, I've, been, I've been hitting on that, hitting on that, and I'm going to continue to do that so we understand. This is all with the understanding that the Holy Spirit is involved. The third verse, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, do you hear what that's saying? Confession is a different kind of belief than what most of us are used to. We believe something because it makes sense to us. You know, we might, we might say that. The belief that we're talking about here is different because it's an acknowledgement, it's a confession of who Jesus is. And when you acknowledge something, according to God's will, and according to, what God, uh, according to what God wants us to do in regards to salvation, we acknowledge that his way is right and our way is not right. And this confession, this confession that Jesus is right, this confession that God is right, this acknowledgement, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him. You see, it's, 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 a way, it's a form of repentance. It's a form that, that says, you know, this is the way I used to believe, but now I believe in God in his way. So I believed in my way before. Now I'm going to believe in his way. Listen to this quote out of the Review and Herald. A theoretical knowledge of truth is essential, but the knowledge of the greatest truth will not save us. Our knowledge must be practical. The truth must be brought into our, their hearts, sanctifying and cleansing them from all uh, earthliness, and sensuality in the most private life. The soul temple must be cleansed, but it can only be cleansed with the power of the Holy Spirit. We, we look at this idea that we have some great role to play in, in regards to the Christian experience. And, you know, I think one thing you have to understand is that when it comes to something we can give God, there's only one thing that you can give God, and that, that's your, your will, your heart. You know, that's the one thing that you can absolutely give God in regards to who you are. Everything else is you're trying to attribute a merit to yourself. And actually, in reality, that's what we're going to refer to as a demerit. Because when we depend on ourselves and what we do, that's a demerit. It's not a merit. A merit is something good, something that was accomplished, something that we can count on. When I was a kid in school, um, when I got into seventh grade, they had a, a demerit system at the school. And that is, is when you broke the rules, you got a demerit. And if you got a certain amount of these demerits, they would suspend you from school. You'd get some type of a punishment for those. Well, I want to tell you, in my seventh grade year, it took me no time at all to use up my allotted amount of demerits. And so I, and it was, it was a simple thing of, of, of not following the standard of the rules that were put in place. And you know, I'll tell you, being suspended over this was, was horrible because I had to spend three days with my folks. And I'll tell you, my folks are great people, but when they're going to work and doing their thing, that's not ideal for a, a seventh grader. Uh, it's not the same as hanging out with your friends. It's not the same as going out and playing sports. This was pure misery for me, and so I learned a valuable lesson, I will say that. 
But I understood something, and I never let this happen again. I had, I had uh, four years of this demerit system. And I will tell you that I came to understand that the system that they had in place was a standard. And that standard was the school's merit. And as long as you acknowledged and did it their way, and I'm telling you, there was nothing wrong with the way they did it, as long as you did it their way, then you were in good standing. Well, understand that's where I'm coming from here on the merits of our, our merits of our own versus the merits of Christ. The merits of Christ are the only way that you are going to have or gain salvation. So there's kind of a process that goes on here. I'm just going to outline this real quick so that, so that I, if, if I could connect all my sermons, I wouldn't have to keep repeating some of the things that I'm repeating today because I've already said these things or they're in context of what I've been speaking. But understand that there's a process that takes place here. Number one, when people are convicted, when you are convicted that your way is not the right way and that God's way is, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And the Holy Spirit is calling you to repent. And repenting, we, we're talking about changing the way that we're doing things. We're talking about acknowledging God's way over our way. We then confess and we renounce those sins. So we are acknowledging who God is and his law. And we have accepted the merits of Jesus Christ. Now understand what it means to accept the merits of Jesus Christ as far as justification by faith. This is kind of a, a mini lesson in that. When we decide that since Christ lived and died for me, since he did this for me, I have sinned and I have no qualification whatsoever to be, to be able to stand before God and, and somehow make up for the sin that I've committed. And so Jesus says, okay, I'll stand in your place and I will take your place and my blood, my merit, will cover your sin. So therefore, you can stand before God justified. And at that point, then, you have the faith of Jesus. And this is how this process works. We are transformed. We are patient. And that's not just talking about being patient, temperament, although that is one of the qualities. It's talking about enduring. We have that patient endurance. We have that obedience. Because we have the Holy Spirit, my friends, because we have the faith of Jesus. And one of the ways that Jesus used to describe in the Bible about the, uh, the Christ's righteousness was, you remember he used that, that, that term, the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, and he has a lot of parables. You know, it's funny, you talk about churches that you go to where people don't like what you're, what you're doing. I had one church that I went to where a guy... He didn't like my sermons because he said I told stories. He didn't like the illustrations that I used in my, in my sermons. And I thought, well, you might as well uh, take the parables out of the Bible then if that's the case. Because the Bible, to actually take the whole Bible and throw it away because the whole thing is a story. So as we look at Jesus in his parables, he talked about the kingdom of heaven. I used to think that the kingdom of heaven was a place. It was a place where you went. So you, the kingdom of heaven was what was going to happen to us and where we would end up if we were faithful. Well, that's not what Jesus was talking about. And as a matter of fact, the Bible defines what Jesus meant when he was talking about the kingdom of heaven. And listen to what it says here. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness. Well, we've just been talking about. And peace and joy, as I said, in the Holy Spirit. I'm only saying it because I'm repeating it because I read it out of the Bible. And so I can tell you, uh, uh, I understand, or I'm starting to understand more all the time, that this righteousness that Jesus is talking about comes about by the Holy Spirit. One of the, one of the examples that Jesus gave about the kingdom of heaven, and you might see it as the kingdom of God, he says it that way too, but he's talking about the spiritual realm of God. He's talking about the spiritual condition. He's talking about Christ's righteousness is what he's talking about and how it's available to every person who will accept it. Again, he says in Matthew 13, 45, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. In verse 46, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. That pearl, my friends, is Christ's righteousness. That's what Jesus was talking about here. When you go and you sacrifice everything that you are, everything that you have, when you say that there is nothing else in this world that is more important to me because I have found that pearl of great price. I am seeking after and I am pursuing that pearl of great price because that pearl of great price 
is Christ's righteousness. This is this whole principle of being justified by faith. It is the whole process of having the faith of Jesus. And I will do everything in my power to gain that. And pearls, by the way, it was an excellent illustration that Jesus used because pearls themselves are, are apparently the only jewel that comes from a living organism. And this makes them rare and it makes them very valuable to people besides the fact that they are pretty, I will say that. But if you want to, by the way, Go and see, this further illustrates Jesus' point. If you want one of these pearls of great price, or this pearl of great price, excuse me, then you'll have to really search for it. One in about every 10,000 oysters has a pearl, and I don't even know if that's an acceptable pearl. There is a pearl in one of about every 10,000 oysters, and it's amazing to think what you'd have to go through to get that. When I was about 13, I, I got a... a uh, well, I wasn't about 13. I, well, on my 13th birthday, I received a pocket knife. And it was the first knife I had ever had that I could call my own. And I, I'll tell you, I was in love with that knife. I, my, I still can, can see that thing in my mind to this day. And it was a very special gift that I got on that 13th birthday. And I promptly lost the thing. And, you know, I searched high and low for that thing because it meant a lot to me. It meant a whole lot to me. Search high and low, I could not find that, that knife anywhere. And so I finally, unfortunately, I finally gave up. And uh, amazingly enough, about a year later, and I need to clarify something here, I was changing the sheets on my bed, but I, I didn't change them once a year. I'm just getting you to understand, on this particular occasion, I was changing them in a fashion that allowed me to move the mattress, and there, just below the, the, the level of the mattress, on the headboard, sat that knife, and it had sat there for months and months that it sat there. It had dust on it by the time I found it. But I'll tell you, the rejoicing in my heart over that knife was the biggest thing. It was just a pocket knife. But you know, to a 13-year-old, that was a really a big deal. But it helps me illustrate my point. If you want something bad enough in life, you've got to go out and get it. And you've probably, those of you that have heard me speak before have probably heard me say that over and over again. You cannot wait for other people to bring those things to you. You cannot wait for anything in life to drop in your lap. You've got to go and get it. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus gave us these illustrations. He wants, us to, he wants this desire in our heart, this drive, to understand that if we really, really want something, we have to pursue after it. We have to really be able to say, I'm going to go after this thing with every bit of strength that I have because I want that pearl of great price. I want that faith of Jesus. And it's not a thing that you can say once I've got it. I've got it. This is a daily occurrence. This is something that you've got to do every single day. It's something that you've got to be motivated about, and you cannot grow weary as a Christian, understanding that to have the faith of Jesus is a daily experience. It's a practical experience. It's, it's, a, it's an experimental experiment, experience, so to speak. Jesus in the Bible had a conversation one time with a, a scribe. And that scribe, interestingly enough, they were experts in the law, although I, I found it interesting, I ran across this one article that said that the scribes knew their place because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were above them in regards to status and, and, and hierarchy. So therefore they knew their place, although they were supposed to be the experts in the law. And this one scribe asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was. And I, I always find this to be very intriguing because it's almost a trick question. To, to be honest with you, when you ask people what the greatest commandment was, what was it that Jesus said was the greatest commandment? And by the way, this, this, what Jesus quoted actually came out of Deuteronomy. Jesus knew the scriptures, of course, better than anybody, but he also studied the scriptures probably better than anybody either, uh, as well. But he was talking about, uh, but in talking about this, this, this whole thing that Jesus was saying, you ask people, what is the greatest commandment? What did Jesus say? And people are quick to say, to love the Lord your God. Right? With all your strength, with all your will, with all your mind. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And, and you know what? He did say that. But that's not exactly what he said to start off. As a matter of fact, that is not the first thing that he said. And sometimes we get so excited about love. And love's a good thing, by the way. The love of God is the greatest thing. But we have to understand, we have to put things in context in regards to what Jesus said. What Jesus actually said was, the Lord, he said, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord. He said that before he said anything else. And do you know why it was that he said that? 
we we'll go back to our scripture for today. And if you read the context and the entirety of the three angels' message, it talks about God as the creator and the life giver. It talks about God as the only way to salvation. It is through true worship that we, that we, we um, understand our relationship to God and what God is asking us to do and to be for him in regards to salvation. The Lord our God is one Lord, and anything... And everything else that stands in the way of your relationship with God is idolatry. And that's why it says, number one commandment, you know what? There's no other God. You can serve only one God. And you must serve only one God. The Lord our God is one Lord. And then he went on to say, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. So the scribe answered him and responded. And listen to what he said, because he responded likewise. He said, that, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. He didn't hear him say anything about the rest of it, because we understand that the basis of righteousness is acknowledging who God is. We are acknowledging his merits. We are acknowledging his plan of salvation. We are acknowledging that faith in Jesus means that we have had imputed to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that we can stand before God as if we had not sinned because Jesus took our place. And you know, Jesus said to this guy, to this scribe, he said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. We were just talking about that, weren't we? You are not far from Christ's righteousness. That is what he was telling this guy. If we are to pursue righteousness, and I really mean that, pursuing righteousness, you've got to put everything else aside. Listen to what it says in 1 Timothy. But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, gentleness, uh, patience, and gentleness. We understand that these are the fruits of the Spirit. We understand that what's being talked about here by Paul is that we must have, we must put away everything that is not godly. We must put away everything that is not righteous in, or, in order to allow us to have a clear head, a clear mind, and to make a choice based on, not on our feelings, but based on what we know is right. But you have to ask for it. Listen to this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And right after that, right after that, the next chapter in Matthew, listen to what it says. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be open for everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks find and to him who knocks it will be open. Do you know what Jesus was talking about there? You know, we just follow the Lord's Prayer, by the way, as well. It's talking about seeking the righteousness of Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it's talking about. Go back. If you don't believe me, go back and read it. Go back and check out some commentary on it. Do some study on it. That is what it was talking about. It was through the impartation of the grace of Christ that sin is discerned in its hateful nature and finally driven from the soul temple. It is through grace that we are brought into fellowship with Christ to be associated with him in the work of salvation. We have to be in cooperation with God. We have to forsake all known sin. And that is a personal choice. That's something you've got to do. You've got to say, what's more important to me? Is it important for me to be a follower of Jesus? Is it important for me to be a disciple of Jesus? Or is it more important for me to be right? And you know, I've been reading a book lately, and um, it talks about this challenge of supremacy that we have, this need to be right, this need to be first. It's so, extremely selfish in terms of what people have and what they do. But unfortunately, all of us go through that at one point or another. And at some point in time, we have to, through the Holy Spirit, forsake everything else, including what we think, as opposed to what we know. If I was to tell you anything that you must do to follow at least a, a, a I don't want to uh, regiment anything, but to follow a schedule in your life, a pattern, to form habits in your life, is that you've got to put your best foot forward to do what you're supposed to do. And one of the most important things that you can do every day, before you pick up your phone and before you check out Facebook or whatever social media, whatever you check, before you check out the news or whatever's going on around you, you need to pick up your, your, your Bible, or at least what you're using for your Bible. I actually use my phone for my Bible sometimes. I mean, I have my Bible sitting right next to my bed. But we have all types of sorts of ways now that we can 
access our Bible, you need to pray. You need to pray before you do anything else during that day. If it's the only, if it's, it's the, if it's the only thing that you can get accomplished in the morning, you need to take time and pray. You need to pray by promise for God's Holy Spirit. Because this is how you're going to understand about the faith of Jesus. The other thing, and this is a daily thing. This isn't just, uh, just once in a while, you know? You stop and think about it. You eat every day. You breathe every day. You sleep every day. You know, most of us go to work every day. And we look at those things and we say they're normal things to do. But I'm telling you, praying for the Holy Spirit, studying your Bible should be normal things you do, just like you eat, sleep, whatever you're doing. These are things that should be part of your life every single day. Remember Jesus said to take up the cross daily. He didn't say once or twice a week or once a week or three times a week. He said daily because every single day is a mini, is a mini eternity to you. And it should be to you. Because that day and that day alone is what you have. And you should seek in pursuing righteousness as well as praying, studying your Bible. What can I do to help somebody else? And this should be a prayer of yours. What can I do to help somebody else? Going to church is another thing you can do. Attending prayer meeting is another thing you can do. And you say, oh, those are just things, Ron. Those are just things. No, they're important things because they show where your heart's intent and your desire is. It shows where your interest is when you take spiritual things. I'm just giving you these examples. There's many other things that I can include on this list. But the fact of the matter is, is that you have to each and every day Take this choice and say, these are the things that I'm going to do. I have to live them. I have to experience them. They have to be part of who I am. Because we want to have the faith of Jesus. Let me define one more time the faith of Jesus. This is how one other person defined it. Accepting the righteousness of Christ and allowing him to live his perfect life in us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And what a beautiful way to put that. I'm going to read to you in closing one scripture, and this scripture has helped me to understand uh, what the faith of Jesus is, and to, to understand it more fully. You've got to dive into it, you know, you read some study, you cross-reference it, you commentary it, you do all these things, but you come to an understanding, of course, through prayer, what is Jesus saying to us in these scriptures? Listen to this one found in Galatians 2.20. Again, I'm going to say it, I think you probably know this scripture. But I'm going to say it, and then I'll read it again with a couple bullet points behind it. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What was Paul talking about here? He said, I'm crucified with Christ. The old man is crucified. Remember that scripture in Ezekiel that I read earlier? I will take out that old spirit, that fleshy spirit out of you, that natural spirit out of you, and I will replace it with a new spirit. That's what he's talking about here. Nevertheless, I live. So he's saying, I'm still alive, but it's no longer the natural person. It's the spiritual person that is now living. Christ lives in me. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ lives in us to transform us. And the life which I now live in the flesh, here I am, I'm alive, I live, but he answers that. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. By the faith of Jesus. That's what he's talking about. I'll tell you, if there's anything you take away from here today, I want you to go and I want you to discover what it is to have the faith of Jesus. I've just been merely given you an outline. I've just given you a little scraping off the top, so to speak. But as you study this more and more, and you will find more and more, as you pray for the Holy Spirit more every day, you will find that Jesus will live in you, he'll, he'll, he'll dwell in you, he will, he will give you his, his righteousness if you just take that opportunity to ask and to, to study these things out and to pray. And that is my prayer for you today. Amen.